social justice, and self-sabotage. I'm making this video primarily for you advocates of the social justice movement, mostly because I've noticed that a lot of your well-intended efforts to bring about a better world are actually producing the exact opposite of the results you're seeking. Basically, I've noticed a lot of fairly obvious self-sabotaging behavior in your movement and its ideology, and I feel that you could easily improve what you're doing first by becoming aware of these recurrently self-destructive patterns, and then by developing correctives for them. So, my game plan in this video is first to examine the more problematic elements of the social justice movement, and then develop a list of easy changes you could make to improve it. But perhaps I should begin by describing some of the indicators of self-sabotaging behavior I'm noticing. In the United States, there could probably be no more obvious indicator of this than the results of the 2016 presidential election, as well as the Democratic Party's demotion to minority status in both the Senate and the House of Representatives. In the international sphere, indicators would include this year's Brexit vote, as well as the rising tide of right-wing nationalism in numerous places in continental Europe, all of which seem directly inimical to your interests, worldview, and agenda. But let's look at Donald Trump's victory, since it seems to be emblematic of the rest of these broader, more encompassing trends in our world. First, like many of you in the social justice movement, I'm personally not terribly happy to see such a loutish clod like Donald Trump become the most powerful human being on the planet. True, he seemed better than his principal adversary, who in my view embodied the very worst aspects of opportunistic pandering, venal influence peddling, and political dynasticism. But to say that Trump was preferable to a character as deplorable as Clinton is to say almost nothing. In any case, immediately after the election, I thought that Trump's victory would be a tremendous boon to the social justice movement, mostly because it would give its adherents reason to re-examine the movement's flimsy and misguided strategies. That's because it seems obvious, at least to me, that the social justice movement and the closely aligned political correctness movement played a significant role in Trump's victory, mostly by irritating, energizing, and motivating his legions of supporters. Basically, my perception is that he owes his victory largely to you, and especially to your movement's over-reliance on strident, overbearing forms of ideological social activism. After all, without the social justice movement, what fraction of Trump's supporters do you suppose would still be interested in him? My guess would be less than 15%. However, contrary to my hopes, Trump's victory has not prompted much thoughtful examination of the effects of the social justice movement on the 2016 election. Despite this year's obvious political reverses, the main thing that seems to be happening in the social justice movement is a kind of doubling down on all of the strident emotionalism, the inflammatory finger-pointing and name-calling, and all of the juvenile histrionic outrage that energized Trump's supporters in the first place. So, my first word of advice to the social justice movement would be, you need to stop trying to find excuses for the political setbacks your own movement is contributing to. The reason Trump won is not because the country contains 62 million deplorably privileged white supremacist cis male agents of racist misogynist patriarchal oppression. Remember that 53% of white women voted for Trump and only 43% for Clinton herself a white woman. And no, that's not because of internalized oppression. It's because you're making hardened enemies out of common everyday people, male and female alike, most especially in the American heartland, people who would otherwise be pretty much neutral toward your projects and agendas. So I would say to you advocates of the social justice movement that the time has come to take mature, responsible ownership of your part in Trump's victory and to adapt your project accordingly. Yes, I realize that this may be a bitter pill to swallow, mostly because it's always an easy cop-out to blame other people for our own failures. But doing that isn't actually in your movement's interest. In fact, all of the sanctimonious post-election name-calling and public hysteria is now generating even more animosity and defiance toward your project, which will likely result in your being disenfranchised from political power even more in the future. Basically, it's time to put an end to the childish habit of treating Donald Trump like the boogeyman. 
The problem is not that Donald Trump is president. The problem is that you've managed to irritate enough of the population to make Donald Trump president. Donald Trump is your wake-up call, a clear sign that it's time to retool your strategies and efforts. And your real enemy is everything that keeps you from doing that. But beyond this, it's important to know how what you're doing is so abrasive to such a large segment of the population, not only within the United States, but increasingly across much of the globe, too. As I indicated in a previous video, a lot of this has to do with the dynamics of shame and judgmental elitism as they appear in the social justice and political correctness movements. The reality is that unless you're living in what cultural anthropologists call a shame society, shaming people is an exceedingly poor way of getting them to change for the better. The reality is that the main effect of shaming in American culture is to generate a lot of defiant resistance and animosity, which of course is exactly what happened in the last election. That's because when we're being shamed, we can usually sense the element of emotional manipulation and coercion in it. In addition, we can usually detect that people who like to shame other people are typically just attempting to place themselves in a position of judgmental superiority. In other words, we tend to react to shaming behavior with resentment and resistance, partly because shaming is manipulative and coercive, and partly because it's a form of virtue signaling, that is, a way of trying to make a shallow, ostentatious public display out of one self-proclaimed moralistic elitism. But perhaps at this point it's not obvious how the social justice movement is doing that, how you're inadvertently creating many millions of enemies by shaming people way too much and way too often. Let's look at a couple of examples. First, the shaming phenomenon begins when you select a self-description for your ideological project that sounds a lot like a self-evidently desirable goal. For instance, consider the phrase social justice itself. Really, aside from a few inveterate sociopaths, who wouldn't want more social justice in the world? But of course, that's very different from the ideological project of the social justice movement, which revolves largely around advancing a specifically leftist political agenda. The shaming dynamic comes into play when anyone who might disagree with that ideological agenda discovers that he or she has already been implicitly and preemptively cast into the role of someone who must necessarily be against the concept of social justice itself, someone who must therefore be some kind of shameless, slavering troglodyte. Basically, the shaming dynamic is woven into the way the phrase social justice is being used as a cover for an ideological position that people may reasonably disagree with. Another example. The same thing is true of the phrase Black Lives Matter. Once again, aside from a few warped psychopaths, who would disagree with the idea that black lives matter? Answer, no one. But once again, the idea that black lives matter is very different from the ideology of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is aligned with a very specific political and policy agenda. So here again, the very name and self-definition of the movement already casts anyone who might reasonably disagree with this ideological agenda into the role of someone who must necessarily think that black lives don't matter. Basically, a raving, unrepentant racist. Again, the shaming dynamic is built into the movement at the ground level of its self-description. But that central nexus of implicit shaming has only expanded as the social justice movement's vocabulary of public disparagement has proliferated over the years. Consider the now common use of highly judgmental virtue signaling pejoratives such as Islamophobic, xenophobic, homophobic, racist, cis scum, misogynist, shitlord, etc. What are these terms, if not fairly transparent, ham-handed attempts to shame people into behaving according to your movement's agenda? And even that might be marginally acceptable if these terms were accurate descriptors of the reality at hand. But the fact is that they're mostly ideological exaggerations, if not outright misnomers. For instance, it's not really true that Donald Trump and his ilk hate women, as the common epithet misogynist would denote. It's obvious that he loves women, 
but he loves them in a very puerile and hence very objectifying way, basically the way an average dopey 15-year-old would. So, when you try to apply the hyperbolic label misogynist to him, people can sense the overreach and the overweening distortion of reality in your vocabulary. And over time, they grow to resent the element of deception in it, and to resent you and your project along with it, which then contributes to the whole dynamic of self-sabotage within the social justice movement. So at this point, I would say that it would be good to remember that the main effect of shaming people and mislabeling them is not to convert them into allies, but to harden their resistance and animosity toward you. Shaming doesn't build bridges. It only generates and deepens divides between people. So my second piece of advice for you adherents of the social justice movement would be, you need to stop all of the ridiculous shaming behavior and the cheap shaming word games too. People are usually smart enough to see right through it, or at least sense it at the gut level. It doesn't reliably change people for the better, and in fact, it has only galvanized millions of people against you and your project. You're only generating more future Trump supporters that way. The second major instance of self-sabotage I've detected in the social justice movement has to do with its exemplars and proponents the kind of people who represent the movement to the general public. It's poster children, if you will. I take it for granted that like any other major movement with millions of adherents, the social justice movement contains both good and bad eggs. I believe that there are truly intelligent and caring people among you. And then there are loudmouth neurotic imbeciles. And most of your adherents probably fall somewhere in between. That's true of any major movement. However, in the case of the social justice movement, the intelligent, articulate voices seem to be few and far between, and the rabid, irrational pathology cases seem very numerous and conspicuous in the public eye. Let me just say it bluntly. This is not serving your cause. Once again, this is making your movement look like a bunch of... of what? Well of simply lousy human beings, people who are acting mostly out of their self-absorbed neurotic fixations and fantasies. Basically, you're letting the clown acts run your circus. It would be much better for your movement if you would make a lot more space for articulate, convincing voices and a lot less space for brain bellyachers who only drive people away from your movement. And by the way, a similar public relations problem is occurring within the Black Lives Matter movement whose poster children consist mostly of unsavory, inveterate criminals with lengthy rap sheets. The hard reality is that until the Black Lives Matter movement learns to stop centering itself on these sorts of cretinous characters, it will never be respected or accepted by the majority, and it will never be a source of genuine positive change in our nation, like the civil rights movement of the 1960s was. Today's Black Lives Matter movement has yet to fathom the fact that the civil rights movement worked because it was championed by highly intelligent, articulate voices, such as those of Martin Luther King, Medgar Evers, and Rosa Parks, whose message elevated people of all races because they themselves were elevated exemplary human beings. In contrast, the most conspicuous names that have inspired the Black Lives Matter movement people like Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Alton Sterling, and Keith Scott, look mostly like a gaggle of low-life petty criminals. And I'm sorry, but Al Sharpton is no Medgar Evers, and Michael Brown was light years away from Martin Luther King. And when the general public sees your supporters chanting in unison for the deaths of police officers, and then sees officers being brutally gunned down in the name of your movement, it does little to foster public sympathy for your cause. All of it makes your movement seem like an empty sham, like it's mostly about trying to deflect everyone's attention away from the real systemic problems that beset the black community, mostly by harping on a handful of highly dubious complaints about the police, the majority of which don't actually hold up when subjected to judicial scrutiny. And here again, all of this amounts to a form of self-sabotage because it's pushing all the wrong buttons in the nation's heartland. That's because most people can see right through the movement's flimsy charade and its unsavory poster children or obvious markers of it. 
So my second recommendation to the social justice movement would be stop letting the clown acts run your circus. Allow your primary voices to be eloquent, compelling exemplars for the rest of the nation, rather than repellent, cranky malcontents who only end up compromising and sabotaging your project. But perhaps above all else, you advocates of the social justice movement seriously need to improve your psychological understanding of the forces that actually change the world, the factors that really alter people's thinking, that change their hearts and their perceptual fields. As we've seen, it doesn't usually come from empty shaming tactics and virtue signaling, and it doesn't come from confrontational tirades by self-absorbed emotional basket cases. The forces that really change the world issue from something that most of us learned on the kindergarten playground. And the lesson is, when you get too loud and too pushy with other people, when you keep abrasively insisting that they have to play your game your way, according to your values and your definition of justice, for example, well, eventually those other people are going to band together and start actively resisting you, which is pretty much what happened in the last election. And then you'll be left standing there, gaping in a rictus of astonishment and chagrin, groping for ways to comprehend why they didn't simply obey your obviously superior agendas and plans. Again, which is pretty much what happened in the last election. To get other people to play your game, on the kindergarten playground or in life generally, you have to learn to behave like a decent, reasonable human being. You have to learn to honor other people's diversity of opinions, perspectives, and desires, even if they seem to be at odds with how you think the world should be. In other words, you have to learn to be inclusive of other people, even if you don't particularly agree with them or don't particularly like them. And most of all, you have to stop behaving like your agenda is the only thing that really matters, and that it should be automatically the only acceptable model for other people's lives. The deeper lesson in all of this is that kindness and acceptance, and eventually even love, is what really changes the world for the better. As Gandhi famously noted, you must learn to be the change you want to see in the world. You can't just badger, berate, and shame the world into becoming a better place to live. And if you want to see more diversity and inclusiveness in society, you must be ready to treat other people accordingly, most especially when you find that their attitudes and values are in conflict with your own. Until then, those values will only seem like hypocritical claptrap to most people, who will then continue to do everything in their power to oppose you. So... My final piece of advice to improve the social justice and political correctness movements would be learn to be consistently decent, reasonable human beings, especially toward people with whom you disagree, and take pains to treat them according to the values of diversity and inclusiveness you so loudly proclaim. Well, those are my principal suggestions for you. Yeah, I realize that some of them may sound like a dose of tough love that you're not particularly thrilled to hear. But one of the realities of life is that change is sometimes an unpleasant process. And so, probably you'll benefit from my advice only insofar as you're able to get past the reflexive temptation to dismiss it out of hand. So, let me move toward ending this video by helping you perceive a few potential stumbling blocks that you might encounter in that process. First, try to avoid the temptation to fixate on my personal race, gender, social class, etc. Viewing my advice in terms of racist and sexist categories won't help your movement change and grow. As I said earlier in this video, I am not your enemy and neither is Donald Trump. Your real enemy is everything you do that distracts you from bettering yourselves and bettering your movement. Second, try to get past the temptation to dismiss what I'm telling you because it's not rooted in any kind of systematic formal research and statistical analysis. My goal here isn't to appeal to you at that level, but to help you grow in ways that are much more fundamental and much more expedient than that. And last, try not to get too hung up on nitpicking the minute details of this video. Instead, try to see the big picture here, because that's probably where your better destiny lies. 
And finally, let me conclude by saying that while I disagree with practically all of your concrete goals and methods, I do agree with the underlying animating spirit I sense in your project, at least in its better moments. Like you, I think, I believe in the importance of helping our world give birth to a better world. I believe in the power of transcendence, both at the personal level and at the level of our collective humanity, too. And I believe in the value of diversity and inclusiveness, so much so that while I disagree with most of the social justice movement's ideological project, I'd still like to hear your voices among the many that are trying to form meaning in our world, even if those voices don't reflect my own personal predilections. Um, actually, that might be a lesson for you right there. Anyhow, as a consequence, my main concern is that if you continue on your current trajectory making so many obviously misguided decisions and strategic blunders, you'll soon be well on the road to self-extinction, which would be a shame. So, my interest in this video is to help you transcend yourselves and reinvent your project in ways that might help keep that from happening. Because, as I said, I believe in diversity and inclusiveness. Anyhow, if you're still not convinced, well, consider the following admittedly portentous question. Isn't one Donald Trump in the world enough for you? Wonder about that. And take care of your souls. Have a great day.